All right, good morning. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about prayer this morning. You know, Ernest Holmes' contribution to the New Thought Tomb of Literature was that he developed this five-step method of prayer. That's not what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I think that, uh, I think there, uh, because we've talked about that, uh, but there are levels. There are different degrees of prayer. And so uh, what I'm interested in is prayer at um, a deeper, more sincere level. Um, I remember years ago going to something in Burbank um, out by the airport. There was an event there with um, Carolyn Mace. And I remember her saying, you are uh, someone who is finite in search of your infinite. And I, and I always liked that. I thought that was really good because we teach in the science of mind that, that consciousness, that spirit, uh, that the real us is there is this infinite aspect to us. And yet here we are in this finite form of a physical body. Um, and I think that at the, the deeper prayer, or the purpose of the deeper prayer is for us to find access to that which is really, really holy. Now people, I think, um, think they're going to find it exclusively through the intellect. You know, now um, that is certainly a path. Um, but you know, there are no answers to the really deep questions about the things that we go through in life without us individually going to a deep place on a consistent basis. There is no refrigerator magnet. There is no bumper sticker. There is no billboard that's going to have this nice pat platitude answer. You know, and, and, people, and people say, well, I know that's not, but they're still looking for it. They're still looking for a, a, a why, which of course is the wrong question, but we'll, we'll get to that. There are no answers to deep questions unless we are someone who goes to a deep place on a consistent basis and goes there with an openness and a receptivity to, to learn, to understand. Um, you know the author Anne Lamott? I love, I love her stuff. She comes around every once in a while and speaks. She has a new book coming out. Uh, in one of her books, she said there are three categories of prayer. And I like this. That, that pretty much all of our prayers fall into three different categories. One is help. You know that prayer. I know it very well. Um, yeah, I don't need to demonstrate that. You know it. Uh, there are the prayers of thanks. You know, like, oh, wow, thank you, God. That worked out. Thank you, God. All right? And then there are the prayers of wow. And those wow prayers show up in lots of different ways. Um, Easter night, I went back east because my nephew and his wife had just had a baby on Easter morning, uh, the first, my mother's first great grandchild. So this was, this was quite thrilling. Uh, little Theo came into the world on Easter morning, and uh, in the next day, I got to hold him. Oh my God, this was an extraordinary thing, this little tiny being. I remember holding him right here and thinking, I've had burritos that were bigger than this. <laughs> I have. You were so little and so precious. And you smell so good. They got that new baby smell that's really good. Wow, this was great. And he's squeezing my finger, you know, and I'm just like, and all I kept thinking was, wow, wow. So that, that was a wow prayer, you know, like, thank you, God, for bringing this new little being into our lives, into our family. Wow. You know, I mean, a day ago, I didn't even know him. And now I'm madly in love with this little burrito. Yeah, here he is. He's my little burrito. Um, you know what it is? I, th I notice that we don't want to give up anything, and we want our prayer to be answered. Mm -hmm. and, because, you know, and if there's no answer we like on the path we're on, then it's best to just change religions. That's it. That's the best thing we'll do. We'll just, I'll just, I need to find a new path. That's it. You know, I, now, now, when we talk about praying in science of mind, we don't mean to beg God. This is what Ernest Holmes is trying to get people away from. Because if you look at all the times you begged in prayer, it was minimally effective, wasn't it? I mean, tell the truth. Most of the time, it seemed like the universe did not respond to that begging. What we teach in the science of mind is that God is already doing all that God is going to do. God simply is. God is ising itself all of the time into the universe, right? You know, in the Talmud, it says that every blade of grass 
has an angel over it saying, grow, grow, grow. So think about it. If God has done that for a blade of grass, if there are angels over a blade of grass saying, grow, 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 what is around us encouraging us each and every step of our journey? You know, out in the world, I think people are afraid of prayer. Yeah. And uh, in fact, they're even hostile toward prayer. Uh, but you know, the spiritual path is, I believe, always about revealing a greater spiritual truth. You know, and so, so a deeper prayer, not that there's any, so first let me say, there's nothing wrong with praying for a refrigerator if you need a refrigerator. People say to me, oh, I think that's very unspiritual. And I say, have you ever lived in Los Angeles without a refrigerator? Because, you know, it's a tough place to be, especially in that long summer, you know, about those nine months there, uh, <laughs> without a refrigerator. You know, if you have kids, it's nice to be able to give your kids a cold glass of milk or a popsicle or whatever. Nothing unspiritual about praying for a refrigerator. Because part of that is we have to learn how spiritual law responds, right? So that, that is certainly a step on the path. But I think a deeper prayer that we will get to um, is, God, you know, show me, show me myself, what I have to do with what's happening in my life right now. What do I need to understand? Where am I off in my thinking, in my way of being? Show me how to become the person who can heal this or move through this gracefully. Hmm? You know, prayer in science of mind does not change God. Prayer in science of mind is to change us, right? To change, because it changes our thinking, which is why it's so important that we do it again and again. I think one of the great gifts of my religious upbringing as a kid is that we were taught to pray every morning and every night whether you wanted to or not. What you want to do has nothing to do with it. You need to pray every morning when you get up, and you need to pray every night before you go to bed. That's just a good practice. And you know, I'm so grateful that that stuck. That has served me my whole life. Even when my faith was in the tank, I still prayed. I wasn't quite sure what I was praying to or how I was praying, but I did it anyway because it was ingrained in me that I should do it, and if I didn't want to, that was probably when I needed to the most. So if I become still and I ask God, what do I need to do, how do I need to be to receive a greater good, to receive healing there, I have to then be willing to sit in the seat of my own consciousness and be quiet, which I admit is really difficult to do. For me to sit down and shut up, it's difficult for most people. I understand that, but you know what? This is not new to us. It was difficult for Buddha's disciples 2,500 years ago. They had the same distractions we have. We think, oh, what, they didn't have, you know, a phone that was going off every minute and this and that. And so, no, but basically the same things. You know, they would get sleepy when it was time to meditate or their mind would jump around to different distractions. In A Course in Miracles, it says, every day the teacher of God, who's the teacher of God? That would be all of us. Every day the teacher of God must ask himself, God, where would you have me go? What would you have me do? What would you have me say? And to who? This really is about I think that that kind of praying is about a surrendered existence. You know, that I want to be here for God's light to shine through me out into the world in the most beneficial way possible. You know, because mystical law teaches us that, that what's within one is within the whole. Now, it may not appear in the whole. It may be in the whole only in potential. Another way to look at prayer that I really like is that prayer is when we are willing to sit in this place of ex examination of our own conscience. Not consciousness, the examination of our own conscience. You know, where, see, because it's this idea that we have to become self-reflective, I think is so important that we will never become deep spiritually unless we develop this capacity to become self-reflective. You know, and sit and ask myself, wow, where do I dance with um, my shadow again and again and again? Where am I dancing with evil? You know, where do I entertain little, little bits of hatred and I tell myself it's okay? Or where do I have a little dishonesty and I justify it? Or where do I still hold on to threads of prejudice and I think that's just fine? See, people think of themselves as too sophisticated to pray. You know, and, and we think we can handle anything now with technology and medical science, and I think it's not enough. 
I need to see, I need to be able to see that there is a greater spiritual truth within me, within all of us, which is God, we teach. Hmm? And so the deeper prayer is saying, God, give me the eyes to see the truth, because the scripture says to us again and again, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. What is that truth I need to see? Because I'm not seeing it. If I were seeing it, I would be free. So if you're not free, there's something you're not in possession of. Right? So there is, you know, and, and God does not withhold. So it's not like God knows why you're not free, but God's not telling. Nope, I'm not going to tell you. I know you want to be free, but I'm not going to tell you. No, it's not like that at all. Your per, you see, the per, human personality self will always tell us lies. You know, we, we, uh, I think this is so for everybody. You know? But what to do in response to that, I believe, is to feed and nourish ourself, our soul, with spiritual truth through reading, through classes, through, most importantly, our spiritual practice. See, the, the personality mind is an obstacle course. It really is. It just grabs onto distractions, or it puts us to sleep, or we can't stop thinking about how hungry we are, or who we're mad at, or we can't sit still today, and my back hurts just too much. You know, and the mind justifies all the bad behavior. The human personality will always tell you, you are justified in hanging on to this unforgiveness or being mad at this person, you know, or remembering something from your childhood, which you think is causative to why your life is the way it is today, perhaps, but perhaps not. You know, so why we pray, you know, you can't defeat all of that chatter just by trying to suppress it down. If I could just stop thinking these thoughts. We've all tried that. That hasn't worked. Has it? It hasn't worked. Just trying to not think something, you know, it's like don't think about a giant pink elephant. Okay, how'd that work? I mean a really big pink elephant sitting next to you. Yeah. Now it's not the person that's an elephant, you know. But. So I think why we pray is because the activity of praying is what begins to quiet and ultimately defeat all of that crazy chatter. See, because we pray to get higher than that voice in our head that's always going, rah, 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 rah. like in the Charlie Brown cartoons, all the adults, they always sound the same, right? They all sound like, wah, 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 wah. and that's what that chatter is, right? So we have to pray. You know, Einstein said you can't solve a problem at the level of consciousness that created the problem. So the purpose of prayer is so we go to a higher place in our consciousness, right? Because that that's where we're going to be in touch with something greater. See, in the science of mind, I believe that we are destined, destined. If you stay on the path of science of mind, you are going to become deeper spirit. Uh, you're going to become a deep person spiritually. And to do that, we have to have an inner life, a rich inner life, so that when life happens, and in the course of a long life, a lot is going to happen. Right? In the course of a long life, we feel like we have an ability to deal with what comes rather than feeling like, wow, I've really been thrown a curveball here. You know, whether it's um, somebody in the family is sick, or there's a loss of a job, or a loss of a loved one, or there's a career disappointment, or whatever that may be. In the course of a long life, there will be lots of stuff. I think about this story um, told about a disciple went to the Buddha who had, and I believe that um, this person had lost a child. And, and, and they were understandably devastated. And they went to the Buddha and they said, well, you're the Buddha. You're the enlightened one. You know, what can you do to help me with this? And the Buddha said, go to every home in the village and find a home where there has been no loss. And then you will have the key. And so this person went to every home in the village. And every home in the village, of course, had experienced loss. They had been through difficulty. Mm -hmm. And so then. What happens is the person has a little more understanding for everybody goes through stuff. You know, it's part of the journey. And, and, you know, and I think that it, it remains part of, I believe it remains part of the mystery of God that not everything is ours to understand fully. See, we want to really, the human personality thinks we should be able to understand all of it. And some of it is what it is. It's the mystery of God. That some of it maybe is not ours to know right now. I mean, think about this. This is why babies spend all that time on the inside before they come to the outside. 
because if they were on the outside the whole time they were developing, we'd be messing with them, wouldn't we? <laughs> we'd be tinkering with them the whole time. So they get to get totally formed on the inside before they come out into the world. So I think, you know, your, your life, your good, for all of us, has to be tied to something greater than something that's in the world. Or we will always feel like a victim. We'll always feel like we are at the effect of someone or something outside of us. See, I, you have to have an inner life, you know, or you'll be asking the wrong questions. Like, why doesn't God give me what I want? Why, do, you know, why don't they love me? You know, why don't they appreciate me? Why doesn't God change them? Because I've been praying for God to change them for years, and they're not changing. You know, you know th there's that part of us. Well, there's part of us that, that we want to quiet, that we want to kind of just settle that down. And my experience is that stuff doesn't settle down till we spend more time in quiet. See, I'm convinced that there's a reason why as we accumulate more years, we're supposed to spend more time in quiet reflection. You know, you're, you know at, at 50 or 60, you're not supposed to be doing what you were doing at 19 or 20. You're not supposed to be because you're in a different chapter in your life and you're supposed to be thinking about different things. You know, certainly at 19, you want to be fed, fondled, financed, and famous. Absolutely, I understand, you know. But at 60, at 60, mm, our focus should be a little different, right? People don't, people don't like to, to, to look at this, you know, that, that we have, that everybody dances with their own shadow, you know, that there is maybe an avenger within us, this part of themselves, you know, that we don't really like. Um, and, and we don't want to admit, especially in metaphysics, nobody wants to admit that they have any darkness at all. Oh, no, I'm all hearts and rainbows and unicorns and flowers. That's all there is to me, you know. Um, and, and, and I'm not buying it for a minute, I'm here to tell you. See, I want other people to give up their darkness, but God knows I want to hold on to my own, right? My, my self-pity, my making other people suffer, or, you know, my being resentful. You know, we say we're on a spiritual path. Well, where is the spiritual journey? It's to your own spirit, to that presence of God that is within you, right? So the spiritual journey is not out here. It's all in here, I believe. You know, now I understand that this is deep stuff. You know, finding my way, telling the truth about how powerful that um, my darkness that I just want to suppress, how powerful that is, and telling the truth also about how powerful my light is. Right? How powerful the love within me, the love within you is. So, so I think when we start in the science of mind, you know, the early prayers are maybe I want, and we learn how spiritual law is working, how it's working all the time. Now that's really important, because spiritual law responds to our thought, to our word, to our deed. But the bigger role of prayer is this inner journey, this inner transformation, this inner illumination. And I need to be still. I need to remember what's important. I need to remember the truth. I think we have to really look at our life today and say, what do I believe about God today? And is it the same as what I believed when I was a kid? Because if you're still believing today what you believed about God when you were a little person, you may need to chisel down that God from childhood. Uh, because for a lot of people, the god of their childhood was kind of a combination Santa Claus, hitman, bellboy. Yeah, really. You know, God, I'm going to make a list. These are the things I want, universe. And oh, by the way, this person I don't like, so snuff them out and this kind of thing. You know, I mean, really. So if, that's, if you've still got that, you need to unpack that, right? And say, OK, what do I believe today? Because of what I see is that people often, people grow up, but their idea of God is still the idea they were taught when they were a child, which perhaps is not serving as well as it could. So often people tell me that they feel like God has failed them, you know, because something out here that they were hopeful for has not taken place. But out here is not what's supposed to change. In here is what's supposed to change. You know, because 
and it is a mystical truth that every thought we think, now think about it, every thought we think is a prayer. And all prayers are heard. Ernest Holmes says that in our textbook. He says, if God ever answers prayer, God always answers prayer. We think, well, where's the answer? Where's the answer? And you just aren't getting the answer you like. I hate that part. I really do. <laughs> See, how our, how our prayers are answered is not our business. There are too many things involved. You know, we pray for a healing. Hmm? If I pray for a healing, my human personality wants to look for the healing. Where, am I healed? Am I healed? Am I healed now? Am I healed now? Am I healed now? Am I healed now? How about now? 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 See, it's not our job to look for the healing, but to have faith that it has been accomplished. You know, so my job is to hang out in the thank you, God, for my perfect healing. Thank you, God, for my perfect healing. Thank you, God, for my perfect healing. Ernest Holmes says that God is love, but God is also law. So the law is this idea of cause and effect. And the love is that we are all interconnected. So if I know that we are all interconnected, I, if I really know this, if I really understand this, I would not do anything to you that in any way would be harmful because that's going to come back to me. Multiplied. It is. Thought always becomes form at some level. Now, think about what thoughts am I generating? And is this really what I want? to be manifesting in my life, in my world. See, it's like the thinking of the world around us is, is like psychic free radicals that are pressing in on us all the time. You know, we hear about free radicals all the time, and you take this to avoid them, and you take this, and all that stuff. But the thinking of the world is pressing in on us all the time. So to not just take that in, to not take in the experience that everybody else is having, we have to be what Mary Baker Eddy says, we have to stand porter at the gate of our mind. We have to be the one who decides what we take in and what we keep out. Right? That every choice we make sets some energy in motion. Right? I mean, think about it. You're talking to someone. And you know if you change the tone of your voice just a tiny bit, it's a completely different communication, isn't it? We you know if um, you send that email, you know how when you go, send. <laughs> That's a very different email than when you say, you know, I'm going to hold this for 24 hours. I'm going to think about it. I'll read it tomorrow after I do my prayer and meditation and see if I still feel this way. That's a different email. You know? Or you think about buying something and you say, mm, I don't know where this was made. I'm kind of supporting slave wages here. Do I really want to do this or not? Let me go home and think about it. It'll still be here later. You know? Because, because everything sets energy in motion, you know? So this is why we want to be mindful of, of the choices that, that we're making. So sort of to sum up, do I have enough awareness to reflect on my life? Am I willing to be uncomfortable and sit in the seat of my own consciousness and say, Spirit, what do I need to learn from this? Why is this here? What is this teaching me? How do I need to be to move forward here? You know, because we teach like attracts like, right? So, so look, this is really simple. Everybody can understand this. Dark thoughts attract darkness. Yeah. But light thoughts attract more light. You know? Love-filled thoughts attract more love. You know? If we're too proud to pray, then we're going to allow that free radical thinking of the world around us to just press in on us more and more and more. People say, well, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to suggest we pray in this situation because, boy, that's going to offend people. <sighs> Too bad. That's all I got. Too bad, you know? So I'd ask you today, what are you praying for? Think about that. And what motivates your prayers? Are your prayers motivated by doubt or fear? 
Or are your prayers motivated really from a place of love, from a place of service? So when we have deep questions, I believe that God always, always has deep answers. But deep answers don't come to shallow people. No. Uh, they, uh, over the oracle at Delphi, it says, for the ancient Greeks, it said, know thyself. Hmm? So if we want answers to the deep questions, we have to be deep people. Right? Like I said, it's not going to be on a refrigerator magnet as sweet as that is, or a bumper sticker. We have to be deep to hear the answer. Deep through practice. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, prayer is, you know, it's, it's not about stuff. It's about you and your relationship to, to your inner life and something greater than yourself and to the truth. So let's turn to that now. So we turn our attention inward for a moment, recognizing that right here where we are, the fullness, the allness of God is. That we are surrounded and filled with God's spirit, God's love, God's intelligence. In fact, that very presence of God within us is the most true, real thing about us. And so in this awareness, I speak the word for us that we are open, willing, receptive vessels for the light and love of God to shine through us, and that anything not like that, Anything that does not serve us, whether it's a thought, belief, idea, habit pattern, old way of being, way of looking at the world or someone in our life, if it doesn't serve, we speak this word that it is dissolved, released, and let go. I speak the word for each and every one of us that whatever seeming difficulty we're moving through in life right now, I know that that wisdom of spirit within us has everything we need to know. And so with consistency, we turn to that for guidance and understanding and upliftment. And today we include in our prayer family members and loved ones, our parents and children. We know that right where they are, God is in its fullness. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world. So all that looks fearful to us, all that would make us doubt or lack faith, we say God is present even in the midst of that as perfect healing, as solution, as harmony, as all needs met. We bless our church and we bless all churches everywhere, synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And I'm certain that we are blessed by being together, that everyone gets raised up. And so with a full heart, I give thanks that this is so. I release this word and so it is. Together we all say, Amen.